let's see, to introduce myself um, real quick, because people sometimes see me, but I'm usually the guy behind the curtain a lot of times. I'm Eric Nielsen, and we are, we are live now from Surprise, Arizona. Um, and yes, it can get cold here. Um, it doesn't snow here right where I'm at, but it is chilly today. Um, and so I met Melissa after, shortly after she got divorced and um, she, has, she had three children when we met and she was homeschooling them with the Waldorf method. And she was worried that that was gonna be a deal breaker for me. But what my experience was, I worked for a little newspaper in Idaho and I was given the education beat. So I spent a lot of time in the schools, not as a parent or a school employee, but as like, as we wouldn't expect journalists to be an impartial, detached observer of what was going on. And I was learning about all these policies that were being put in place at the time, like No Child Left Behind. And I was really floored because it was, they, the focus was all on the tests these standardized tests. And not only was the focus on the standardized test, the schools were told that nobody could not pass them. And if they didn't, there would be cuts in funding. There would be cuts in teacher pay if not everybody didn't pass this test. And then I found out that the tests and the test scores attached to the schools were affecting the property values. So then I, in my mind, I thought these kids are commodities. These kids are on a on a uh, conveyor belt, their numbers, they, and I thought it was kind of horrifying. And so, you know, like the image of like the Pink Floyd movie popped in my head when I thought about it. Granted, that's not exactly what it looked like, but it started to feel like that. And so when I met Melissa and I was like, I had didn't, I didn't even question it all because I totally got what it was she was doing and why, because I'd spent all this time um, in these schools not as a parent or a teacher, but just watching what was going on. Um, so that's me. And I'm gonna introduce everybody else. We have, we have Jack Patrash. He is a longtime Waldorf teacher and he um, runs the Nova Institute, which is working to bridge a gap between mainstream education and Waldorf education. Um, we have Paul Johnson and he is a, he is a father of three children that are being homeschooled with the Waldorf method. We have Jamie York. Um, he's a, he, he refers to himself to, as a math missionary. He is, runs the Jamie York Math Academy and he's written Making Math Meaningful. We have Gerard Sekir and he is a second, a grade two, a class two teacher with the Seasons of Seven Virtual School. And we have Mark Lewis and he's a music teacher at Seasons of Seven Virtual School. And Matt Shelton, we have just met. He has started a new website called waldorfdads.com. And I've been looking at it and it's really, and it's, um, I think there's gonna be some really cool things there. And it's, it's him sharing some of his journey with, with Waldorf and his family. And then we have David Sewell McCain. And, and he, uh, one of the things he's probably most known for is Sparkle Stories. And there's probably not a day that goes by that I don't hear the, the opening tune to the, uh, to the stories. Um, actually, there's probably not a day that I don't, there's, there's, there's probably not a day I don't hear that song about three or four times. Because our youngest daughter, Soraya, is a really big fan. So now we're going to get going on some of the questions. And so, um, and that's something I talked to all you about. Um, we work with families all over the world, but primarily it's the mom that contacts us or, or um, is a customer or um, is seeking coaching. And time and time again, it's how do I bring this to my husband? How do I get my husband to understand what I'm doing? Um, that's not always the case, but that's something that we come up with often. And, and one concern we get is the worry that Waldorf education is not rigorous enough, especially in the realms of math and science. And I thought I'd throw, start this question out to, um, to Jamie and to Jack, um, what their perspective would be on, on that concern. 
I'll, I'll let you go first, Jack. Go ahead. Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> um, well, honestly, I've often had the same uh, concern. I, I like to think that our schools are rigorous in our teaching of history and geography and math and science. Um, but I think rigor is a good thing. When I was trained at uh, the school where I did my graduate work, it was a school where rigor was an important part, but the understanding was that, that rigor is broadly based um, because you want children to be rigorous in what they learn so that they're well-educated. Um, you want them to be rigorous in the, the way that they're taught to write because writing is such a fundamental part of uh, expressing your thoughts. But you also want them to be rigorous in how they listen to their teachers and to each other. And you want them to be rigorous in the way in which they do their work, their sense of responsibility. So I like the word rigor. And I like to think that our schools um, should be rigorous. Um, having said that, um, I often think about how do we prepare kids for tomorrow, for the world that we can envision. And that reminds me that we can't give them answers um, because the answers that we give them probably will not be adequate for the questions that they're going to encounter as young adults and as adults. And so instead, you want to give them capacities. And those capacities um, have to do with the three basic tenets of Waldorf education, which is educating children to be um, clear, attentive thinkers and to be resilient, emotionally engaged students and to be um, responsible in terms of what they do. And, and those capacities are really what we want to develop rigorously. Um, so I often think about that when I think about, well, how are we doing with math and science? And um, one of the things about Waldorf education, and I don't mean to go on too long, Jamie, is that um, we're really teaching children to think differently. And that's been my takeaway from my years of teaching. And that's been my understanding of what was intended when uh, the Walter schools were started, that we we're gonna educate children to think with their, their whole human intelligence, which means both their analytical, their cognitive intelligence, and also their intuitive, um, emotional, affective intelligence. And so a lot of what we do is we teach through art, and as we'll speak about, I'm sure we'll hear, we teach through story, um, we th teach through interpersonal relationships. We just teach in many different ways to help children have a good sound education. And I just wanted to show, I have a couple of examples of work that my students did in eighth grade, my last class. And it really, I think, doesn't do a bad job of showing the rigor. This was from an anatomy block in eighth grade. And I don't know if you can see this, but here's, it's the vertebrae, the human vertebrae. And, you know, when children draw something with this detail, they know it, they know it deeply. And then they understand um, what they're learning on a deeper level. And um, here's just one other illustration. But if you know middle school students, you know that getting them to work this carefully doesn't just happen. There has to be a rigor and it's a rigor in what they, what they bring to their lessons. So that's my hope. I, I think Walter schools should be rigorous. I think that they often um, aren't known um, enough for their rigor. Those are my thoughts, Jamie. Thank you, Jack. Um, I, yeah, I would agree um, with everything that you just said. I think I'm going to put a slightly different spin on it, however, and that is oftentimes when I hear these kind of questions, they, they're really questions that come out of a place of fear. And fear plays, I think, a pretty big role in our society. I used to say that long before 
you know, we all the, some of the issues that we have uh, in today's world uh, were visible. But yeah, it's um, how much of this is coming out of a place of fear. And then secondly, what do we mean by rigor? What does that really mean? Now, I would agree with Jack that rigor really means a, a, an education that really goes into depth. And in terms of I'm a math teacher. And, and so in terms of mathematics, it means to think deeply. But usually when people don't think of this very think of the question, what do we mean by, in this case, this question of what is rigor? Uh, if we don't think about that thoroughly, then we actually have, a, I think, quite a misconception because usually what it kind of means is, well, it means that they're kind of ahead. It means that they're kind of winning some sort of competition. And, and I think underneath that is this this unconscious assumption that somehow the purpose of education is a competition that we need to win. And honestly, I like to think anyway that that Waldorf education is is really rising above that. And I think I, I absolutely believe that we need to get out of that. Now, I, I should say, first of all, that I'm a product of that mindset. You know, and I, I went to a, a decent public school in Connecticut. And to me, the purpose of school was as a competition was to win the competition or, or to do well in it anyway. And so, yeah, I, I learned how to play the game. And, and certainly from the point of view of mathematics, mathematics ended up being some sort of game. The game being, okay, your, your job is to do the homework that you need to do, or at least give the teacher the impression that you've done the homework so that you didn't get a bad homework grade, for instance, and then, and then to pass all these tests. And, and I have to say it wasn't, it wasn't based upon deep thinking. And in fact, to some degree, I was thinking as a student that I was successful at the game if, if I could actually do well on my tests with the minimum amount of effort and perhaps I didn't learn it very deeply at all. And that was totally okay because my test scores were good. And I ended up going to a good engineering school and continued to play that game and be good at the game. And so I like to think that Waldorf education has risen above that. And we're kind of, we're not playing that game in terms of a competition. Now, don't get me wrong. I absolutely believe that our students not only should have a rigorous uh, education, but they should be prepared for whatever, not for whatever comes next in their life. And yes, I want them to be, and we say this often as Waldorf educators, we want them to be prepared for life. And so to, again, to penetrate these questions, what does it mean to be prepared for life? That's a very interesting question that we could have a whole conference and discussion about that. Or let's just say, what does it mean to be prepared for college? Now I've, I've taught for a long time in uh, Waldorf High School here and at Shining Mountain Waldorf School in Boulder, Colorado. And I've had many students prepared to go off to Ivy League schools, engineering schools, you know, the whole gamut. And, and they were very well prepared. I would say they were better prepared than what their peers were. What do I mean by that? Well, in terms of preparation, I'd have to say that a concern that I've heard voiced often, and you hear this, that for instance, if you talk to somebody who um, is in the world of engineering or, or the tech world and so forth, you'll often hear complaints that the students, that the people coming to them, graduating from college and now starting in their, their company, there's often the complaint that they're not really prepared for what they really need. What do they really need? They need people that can truly problem solve. So the complaint is these people coming out of engineering schools and they're fine, they're good at, as I was, they're good at solving problems they've seen 50 times before. They're good at solving problems that the teacher told them how to do, that they were essentially blindly given without thinking, just memorize how to do this, take the test and you're okay. But they're not very good at true problem solving. They're not very good at thinking of creative solutions. So this leads to another question. Yeah, so in terms of a math teacher, this is what it's all about. It's about, it's about deeply thinking about questions. That's what math and end science should be. And so this next question is, you know, what does it really mean to problem solve? What, 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 what allows one to think creatively about new problems? Because as Jack said, we don't know what the problems are gonna be in the future. We don't know what the big questions are, we're not. We don't really know what society will look like and what questions and that we're going to need to solve. 
But what allows for someone to solve new problems that they haven't seen the solutions to before, what allows that is the capacity to think creatively. And what allows for that? That's a big question right there. What allows for someone to think creatively? And I would say it's not this race to get ahead. You're not going to be better at math and science because you've been fed cold, meaningless facts about, I mean, I remember being in sixth grade and knowing you know, an oxygen molecule or an oxygen atom had, I think it's eight electrons, protons, neutrons. I knew all this stuff. I even made a styrofoam model of it, which to be honest, that isn't really what an oxygen atom is, but I was told that. And sure, there are many other scientific facts that I memorized, but I can't say that I was really educated in a way that I could think creatively. Um, to at that point in, in, in my life. So, you know, these are questions. And I like to think that Waldorf education, by not engaging in this blind race to just get ahead, but instead to go deeply into subjects and to really, this is what I try to do as a, as a Waldorf math teacher, to get them to take the time, slow down, and to get them to discover for themselves some of the mathematical principles. And it would be true for science and other subjects as well. This idea that education isn't something that we just feed to students and that they just sort of, we just pour it into them. Instead, it should be something that they are an active participant in, in their own development. And this idea to imagine that discovery should be a huge part of math and science. So let me ask you, in your own education, did you have the good fortune to really experience on a regular basis what it meant and what it felt like to be discovering things for yourself? I know I didn't. And oftentimes people who would look at a program and say, that's rigorous. And it's not really because they're actually not given that opportunity to discover, to create, and to actually experience the essence of what math and true math and science really should and ought to be. I, so. I like that you mentioned fear um, and, and almost a sense of lack that, that people would bring to their thoughts on education as when I worked as an education reporter, and it was this was over 15 years ago when, you know, the No Child Left Behind thing was starting up, and the State Board of Education was throwing out all these different ideas about how to get where they thought they were supposed to be, and I talked to the woman on the phone, and she started rattling off like, our test scores are behind China, our test scores are behind Finland, they're behind Japan, and my first thought was, how do you know they're the same tests that everybody's taking? But there was this hysterics behind it. And then I thought if the hysterics is at the top, at least in the state of Idaho that I was in, then it's coming down to all the teachers and then to the kids, the anxiety, somehow that it mattered whether that a, a kid in China scored better than them on a test. Well, I mean, think of it. What was, when that term was first uh, coined, leave no, no child left behind. I think collectively our entire society or certainly our entire parent body in this country kind of collectively looked at each other and said, oh my God, is my child behind? So immediately it put them in this place of fear, right? And, and that's what it is. It's so fear-based. Our education, our world today is obviously increasingly fear-based and, and this is a concern. And I think we need, you know, we all know that when you're in a place of fear, you don't make good decisions. You can't think clearly. And so this is something also that we need, I think, to talk to parents about how much of what you're saying right now somehow has an element of fear behind it. And can we get out of that and truly ask, what do you really want for your child? What is really important? What do you think a good education really ought to look like. And very few parents, when you really go deeply into that question and ask them, will say, yeah, I just want them to have as much stuff as quickly as possible. And I want them to have lots and lots of homework. But very few parents would ever say that. In the same conversation, this woman was telling me about plans to get kids on career path, on education paths based on careers that they were deciding they wanted to do in like fifth grade. And I joked and I said, some of these kids want to be, you know, at the time, like Tony Hawk, the skateboard guy. And I, I think if I was in the room, she would have throw, thrown something at my head. She just went, blah. But, <laughs> so that, um, but yeah, that trickles down 
to everywhere. Um, so a question I had for, for David and for the others here that, that also want to talk about this is, is um, stories and telling of stories is a huge part of the education method, especially um, at the beginning. Um, so I wanted to ask you, why is the, what is, why is the role of stories and storytelling so important in Waldorf education? Thank you. Um, well, I've been thinking about this and my relationship to stories has changed a little since teaching. And it's become really pedestrian to me and become really sort of ordinary and less a skill and more a thing that we all do, like walking. And so like Jamin McMillan's relationship to walking is different because he has so much consciousness about going from here to there. It's a beautiful thing, watch, walking a watching a, a dancer walk. But most of us don't think about walking. We just go over there because that's what we use walking for is to go there. And I think of storytelling that way that um, human beings and definitely the, the, the child version of human beings, that's just how we communicate. We just tell stories all day. But very few of us actually have consciousness of that process and intentionality behind that process. Whereas in Waldorf education, there is great um, appreciation for storytelling, not just the, there was once a frog. Um, really everything that is happening in the day is imbued with storytelling. And so there's a lot of consciousness and intentionality and recognition that it's almost like, you know, the teacher training doesn't use this phrase, but sometimes I do. It's almost like casting spells. So not only do you want yourself to be understood and you want the, the listener to really receive the seed of what it is that you're trying to give them, um, but you're bringing transformation. You have an intention of the classroom to just chill out for a minute, you know? And so you say, that reminds me of a story. And then suddenly the room's quiet because we all want to hear that. It's a, it's a switch that goes off in our head, story coming. And so we change and Waldorf does that. And it's not alone. There's, I mean, just think of no child left behind. That's not Waldorf, but that's a great story. That's a transformative moment that changed everybody in a few words. No child left behind. I'm on board with that. I don't want to leave a child behind, just like you were saying, um, Jamie. So, you know, the advertising world and worlds of politics and, and big business, they all understand the power of storytelling. And Waldorf Education understands the power of storytelling. It just gets people to do stuff. I mean, I hate to put it that bluntly, uh, we do it in a really loving way um, built out of spiritual science to understand like the different levels of, of what it is that we're doing and taking responsibility for that. Whereas I don't know that a lot of sales and politics, et cetera, necessarily do that. Uh, so I do think that within the rigor and within the uh, um, striving is also a recognition that uh, we're giving these children a consciousness around how they talk. So when they go to a college interview, when they go to someone that they're interested in and ask them on a date, so that when they go um, you know, to another country and are trying to figure out what's going on, they know that they can tell a good story in a short way to really make their, their, their point, get the message across. And that's, that's pretty yeah. useful. So that's what, I'll, that's, that's what I would say. That's good. Um, does, does anyone else have anything they'd like to add to that? I do. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Oh. Yeah, if I may. Um, thank you, David. That's beautiful the um <clears throat> the idea that we're all storytelling all the time um 
and that in Waldorf education, there is intention behind it and there's, there's transformative power there. And um, when my children were little and if they were going through something, uh, my wife or I would make up a story that would be addressing exactly what ever issue they were having, but it was veiled and the, the, you know, the, um, the frog <laughs> that David mentioned, you know, would be my son. And, and the story would send the frog on some sort of an adventure that would um, address the issue exactly that he was dealing with and offer some, some insight into it, offers maybe even uh, a few ways that he might solve the problem that he's having. Um, and that's something that my children have kind of, you know, have taken into the world uh, and figured things out and learned how to solve problems and have become fuller human beings by this power of storytelling, this transformative power. I think it's a, it's, it's a basic human need to hear and tell stories. Um, and I think that when there is intention behind it and especially loving intention, that transformative power is incredible. Well, that's really good. Thank you. Um, so I so move on to the next one. This is kind of more directed towards Paul and Matt. Um, what would you tell other dads about the benefits of Waldorf education for your children and family? Um, yeah, so I, I'm new to, uh, I guess, getting on to Waldorf. Uh, my wife is, uh, from Germany, she's very familiar with it. And now that we, uh, I became a father about a year ago, starting at that point, I'm looking at education. And, and this was, when I found Waldorf, it was, uh, I think something that I wish I had that I didn't know was there. Um, I think Jamie York, like really put it out there with, with I think other education being grade focused for me, I saw, okay, this is what you want from me. I was, I also just was like, okay, what is the minimum I have to do to achieve what you want from me so I can spend my other time doing what I like to do. And in a way, look, it was, it was almost like I was uh, finding ways. I was learning, doing problem solving on ways to achieve what they wanted without, uh, focusing on the content they were giving me. So I would, it, it was, to me, it seemed like my skills were more uh, on the problem solving creative side of things. And they just wanted answers from me. And it was, I don't think the best use of my, uh, when I was growing up and learning, I think I could have learned a lot more and a lot better uh, in a lot better ways uh, through Waldorf um, and having that, you know, even translating to now, um, I see that in uh, like my career with uh, being a surgical microscope technician. Another example, this is just an example is that the, when I was getting my certification, the person giving the, the certification test and training, he told us, he's like, look, I'm going to have, I'm going to go through the training with you and whether or not you get the certification, you're going to have to take a test at the end. That's going to be a, just a, you know, fill in the blank test. He's like that, that test doesn't matter to me. He's like, if you can't actually do what you need to do in the field and physically we had to work on the microscopes to know how to problem solve. He's like, if you can't do that, I'm not, even if you pass the test, I'm not going to give you the certification. And I think that to me is similar to the Waldorf education where you're the hands-on approach, the, the learning to learn that uh, is what I think I would have benefited a lot more 
with, with that ed education when I was younger. Um, the, the other, so, so that's, I guess, jumping forward, but going back to right now with me looking at what uh, it offers, my wife has been pointing out a lot of things that I didn't think about with, uh, with our daughter being only just turning one. I'm being a lot more conscious of the toys we're getting. And she's pointing out like the little uh, peg dolls and stuff that just have the, uh, they'll just have the eyes on it or face. And I ask about that and it's, it's the imaginative play. It's not the doll or, or the uh, character having pro projecting an emotion for the kid to be like, Oh, this is what the doll is doing. The kid's coming up with what emotion does the doll have? And that's just this higher level that it's, I'm, I'm, I never thought about that. So I'm just really interested in this whole uh, journey we're about to have with education. We have our second kid coming here this month. So I'm very, uh, I guess, uh, intrigued and looking to learn a lot from all you guys and this whole, uh, I guess, new uh, education that I wasn't familiar with and I wish I had when I was younger. I, I totally wish I had it when I was younger. Yeah. Um, Paul, do you have any anything to say about, um, any comments about that, what you would say to other dads? Sure, uh, definitely. Um, <clears throat> I actually really thought about this and just I jotted down some things I wanted, wanted to say. And that one of the big things I see is the, the kids, um, and it's been talked about directly and indirectly by everyone that's spoken so far is this idea that the kids are learning to question and think, not just regurgitate. Um, that's probably the single most favorite thing that I, that I like about it is that I, I see them doing that. Um, and they're learning things in multiple ways uh, to really understand. Now, I'm pretty sure this comes from uh, Jamie's program in math, but at watching the kids, my, my wife talk to the kids and be like, well, what is 10? Well, 10 can be nine plus one, 10 can also be two times five. Um, you know, using objects to count and sort. Um, just the other day, they were working on fractions and I walked out of the office here to see them walking backwards and counting, counting down by quarters through, through numbers. And so they're moving their body as they do it too. It's not just, okay, here's your multiplication table, memorize it, although, it is important, you know, to, to have that skill as well. It's just not only that. Um, along with the, the, the drawings that, that, you know, related to what Jack was talking about, um, I see them not just making up stories or writing, I see them drawing them as well. And then they, they tend to remember the story. It means more to them. Um, that seems to really help them all the drawing. Um, another thing I've seen is the idea of putting things to bed where I'm still figuring out exactly um, everything that means, but sometimes they'll be presented something or a story or some kind of a lesson, but it isn't explained to them on purpose. And then the next day after they've had time to think about it overnight, they're, they've come up with all these questions. Well, what about this? I bet it works like that. Or they're coming up with it on their own. And I just love watching them do that. And I know that I went through public school and it didn't work that way. Um, so basically I see the kids having insightful questions instead of just being told everything. Um, let's see. One of the other things, uh, the, the benefit is watching, you know, some people would say that Waldorf teaches to delay reading. I don't really like it. Watching what happened with my own son, I don't like that wording. Um, I think everyone else is rushing reading <laughs> and Waldorf is actually doing it uh, properly. Um, but I watched my son or both of them now, just one's further ahead than the, in the other. It, it felt like he learned how to read and his vocabulary tripled like in a month because he was, I guess the term would be developmentally ready to read. And we actually had a conversation with a friend of ours who's 
I guess you would say classically trained as a public school teacher, elementary school teacher, but she was even saying the same thing that when she looked through the information that she was taught that it actually did teach that a child is most developmentally ready to read at the age that Waldorf does it. And she's actually tried in her school system to get them to change that unsuccessfully, but it wasn't stressful. It wasn't irritating. He wasn't frustrated. I mean, he was just excited to read and it's like he just picked it up quickly. And now I'm watching my middle boy go through the same process. And it's a lot more fun to see them want to sit down with a book and read it and hear them using the vocabulary um, properly. And we get comments all the time from friends and family and people that meet the kids like, boy, they really have quite a vocabulary. Boy, they really ask smart questions. They, they're really, they really pay attention. They really see things for what they are. It's really interesting. Um, I don't wanna go on too long here. Just a couple more thoughts. Um, you know, the kids get far less screen time than most kids. We don't have zero screen time, but it's far less than most kids. So I see them coming up with their own creative stories and gameplay all the time. Uh, crafts, they'll just randomly get things out and start making like one of the boys was making a catapult out of some tape and sticks and stuff. Uh, uh, outside play, they're a lot more interested in going outside to play. We've had uh, families down the street saying, you know, telling us thank you that your kids invite my kids outside to play and get them outside. And so that's, and I don't know any parent that wouldn't want their kids to play outside more, especially in today's, you know, screen world, right? Uh, and then the last thing I would say is, you know, more time together. The, the kids aren't, they, they want to be with mom and dad. They want to go outside and play. They want to read stories together. Uh, you know, we watch movies and do stuff like that too, but um, I hope that was helpful. Those are my thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I, I wanted to add just one uh, example, I guess, of I that for me, uh, it showed kind of the power of of not of of teaching and learning outside of just the 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 common practice. And there were I don't know if you guys know this song, but we in fourth grade we learned a song. It was like the 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 all the states and that to me you you sang it was alabama alaska arizona arkansas california colorado and all the states in alphabetical order and we had a fourth grade, a substitute teacher come in and it was you know going over geography and all the states she's like okay i want all i want all the kids to write down as many states as you can think of and our she didn't know we knew this song and the entire class wrote down in alphabetical order all 50 states. And she just dropped like, like, this must be the most brilliant. Like, what are they doing at this school? And I think that just shows the power of not, it, there's so many multiple ways to get the information and for, for kids to learn and learn to learn uh, besides a lot of the basic methods that I think are are uh, given now so that was just an example to me like when I thought back in my childhood of like wow I was able to do that very quickly and if I were to try and memorize that all the states in a different approach there's no way I could have done it and you know without without doing it through through music so that was just an example I had that I think other parents might be able to relate to the song was 50 nifty united states yes Exactly. <laughs> it, yeah, I wasn't familiar with that one. But, but you've had it sung to you more than once. <laughs> it's the best. I love that song. Yeah. I think that's just a great example of how you can, there's more than one way. I had this experience where I said to a group of teachers who were in training, I said, you know, I have one regret as a teacher. I, I taught all the way through eighth grade and I, wanted to write a rap song on digestion and I didn't do it. And this other teacher contacted me several months later and said, well, you know, I was thinking about what you said. I wrote that song. This fellow Jason teaches up in Minnesota and he sent me a MP3 file on it and it was great. It went like this. He said, it starts in your mouth when you're eating your food, chew it up with your teeth. Yes. Good. 
break it up into pieces, lots and lots of bits and get it all wet, all covered with spit. Yes, saliva, secretion, it helps with digestion. There's one thing I forgot to mention, the tongue. Oh yeah, the <laughs> tongue, oh yeah. And it went from there, but it was the greatest thing. I taught that to seventh graders. They knew the process of digestion from start to finish through that song that he wrote. It was great. <laughs> People didn't realize that Jack was going to rap today. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Thanks to Jason. <laughs> it's kind of exciting. You don't know what's going to happen next. <laughs> um, this was a. This has kind of been covered a bit, but but um, if um, let's how how well do Waldorf educated children transition to college settings or pursuing? particular trade like what what advantages do they have and we've kind of touched on this a bit before but I thought I'd see if anyone else had anything else to add about that topic um hi uh, you know I think often we, we I think we again should have a continuous theme about competition and what people want to do and you know what I've just also seen what children accomplish in, in high school because they still have the ability to have woodwork and like you call it metal shop. And so I think there's always a misconception that the children only go into graphic design or art or things like that. But I had a very interesting conversation once at, at a conference and they were professors from uh, UCT. And it's always like a, a bit of an anecdote, UCT, uh, University of Cape Town. We said, you can always see the Waldorf children are the ones that sit right in front, ask the most questions, get things done quickly, um, because they're kind of just used to it. They, you know, their main lesson books from class one, you're doing project work, ultimately, you have to take ownership of that from, from day one. And so what I, I've, my experience is just seeing what children have experienced in a rich curriculum right through from kindergarten, and they find what they want to do. So uh, I've been, you know, I've been fortunate enough to have taken the class through and seen them in high school. And then you kind of see that little fire ignite. And many times they want to do what they're passionate about, not because mom and dad want you to become an accountant or a lawyer or a doctor, or, and you have the capability of doing it. So they, they really just get on, on with it and they are passionate about it. And, um, you know, in our final year, they do their um, class 12 and then they do their 13th year in which they write their finals. And what I find is they, they not, they're just learning, they, they're learning to write a test, they're prepared and they, they, they've chosen their subjects and they want to go to university and they want to do their thing. So they, they get quite driven. They're often quite bored because <laughs> it's just tests. They... They're not doing anything except getting that piece of paper. So it's, and because your teacher kind of knows you, you've got your guardian and you have a relationship, you really see what um, the child is interested in. And there's always this guidance and being in a relationship with the parents, you, you tell them this is what your child is really good at and support this. And then they find their way and they find their niche and they, and they are fine. They're fine. And, and you know what? I think um, we've touched up on fear because it's, it's our fear. We want the best for our children. We want them to have the degree. We want them to have the job. We want them to do those. Well, one of these days, we're six feet under, and no one's going to care about what you got and what you didn't get. But we want them. We all fail, failed in maths, but we want our child to have a distinction. Yeah. And we want our child to do science, but we don't know how to balance <laughs> a formula. And, and, and so we have to find that, 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 that balance and really see it. And I always find it's very powerful in the high school when that each subject addresses the child's development, even in high school. When you look at possible, when you look at acids and bases, and, um, and, it, and I, I love to see when that awakening comes and, again, they get on with it. They just do it because they, no one sits behind you in a wonderful school, you take ownership. So 
I sometimes when I do speak to them, they find university agrees. It's not everyone, but um, they they enjoy it and they and and they find their way in the world. And often because of a rich curriculum, they want to see the world. They want to go and experience. They want to savor it. And you often get. I've I've bumped into a ex student. She did. <laughs> um, she went into chemistry. She went into genetics. She did exceptionally well. Hated it. Hated it. And she, she loves doing yoga and she loves working with children and she's become a, a fantastic, she's got the degree, but she hated it. She said, it's empty. It doesn't feed me. I said, yeah, you're a real walled off child. But so they, they rise to those challenges. It's just what I, in the experience of the children I've met. Can I just give you an experience of um, my own daughter, who's 25 now, um, and who went to school for uh, international relations and was um, incredibly artistic and creative. And uh, she made this map on the wall behind me, um, which, you know, it, I don't know if you can scale wise, it's, it's like six feet tall, it's far away. Um, but she, uh, and she's, um, does interior design and costume design and art and she's like just really creative individual but found a passion for uh helping people and went into international relations so that she could um help bring uh, educational programs to places like you know for for uh girls in india where um, young girls are not encouraged to go to school um, you know, especially in rural uh, areas. And so she traveled to India and went around and, uh, you know, interviewed um, people in the, in the government and tried to find out how she could help to, you know, to bring educational programs there. She's traveling all over the world all the time. And uh, as far as her being prepared for university, um, like you said, Garage, she just, it was a breeze. She was like, what, a, <laughs> what's so difficult about this? And she did the thing where she wanted to, to uh, engage with her professors, where she wanted to sit up front. She wanted to ask all the questions. And she, um, yeah, she was incredibly well prepared for, for that journey. Um, yeah, that's all. Because because she because she had a ravenous mind, right? That's one thing that that I think Waldorf education gives these kids is just a voracious mind. They just want to know more about how it works, what happens, what's the process, how do we get there, what are the questions, and what are the questions behind the questions. And I I just think that's a that's a beautiful thing. And if you, you know, if you have that, you're prepared for anything. Our youngest, uh, Soraya, asks questions all day long, all day long, and it's always <laughs> keeping me on my toes. And she asks the craziest questions. And some of it, it's like, I about died the other day. She's like, Dad, if the virus comes from China, why do we have this thing that says it's made from chi in China and this other thing that says it's made in China and the virus came from China? It's like, that's a very good question. <laughs> I don't have very good answers for you, but that, that's a very good observation. <laughs> and she's nine and she's asking questions like that. Um, I don't know if that's the best example, but it is nonstop questions with her about why things work, this doesn't make sense. Why do people do this? Why is that happening? Um, and it's like, you're asking better questions than most of the adults that I know right now. <laughs> Can I tag on to that? Sure. So Eric, it is interesting. We are producing, I just wanna maybe add a little bit of a twist to some of this conversation. Um, I wouldn't make the statement that Waldorf graduates have an easier life in and in an easier path than other students. There's, think of it, if we're training these students, uh, training is not even the right word, but if we're teaching these students in a way such that they go out into the world being more questioning, 
to be what I would argue is more than anything that's needed in the world today is the ability to think independently, to think for yourself, to not just do what you're told. If that's true, if we're truly able to do that, and I do think as Waldorf educators, Waldorf educators, we're, we're actually quite successful in doing that. That comes, that, that's not the easy path. That comes nope. with some added challenge. And I just wanted to say that, you know, there, there, there are two things that, that maybe are added challenges that our Waldorf students have that maybe other students don't have so much. The first one is trying to decide what the heck you're going to do with your life. Because it's often not an easy choice for Waldorf students because they have so, so many, many of them, not all, but many of them end up graduating from Waldorf High School having so many interests that it's hard for them to focus into one thing and to decide what to major in and so forth. Because the reality is when you get to college, you can't do it all anymore. Whereas, yeah, they could do it all pretty much definitely all the way up through eighth grade and largely in high school still keep doing that. That's the first thing. And the second thing is I tell my Waldorf students that you have, you are given the burden that you have to be extra careful about choosing where you're going to go to college. Because the reality is if they just go anywhere, oftentimes I find they get disappointed because they get out there and they find that the education that they're seeing then in university and college does not automatically have that same level of meaningfulness that they had, what they were used to in high school. And they can end up disappointed. They don't automatically get that connection to their professors and instructors that they had in high school. So that's an added challenge. They have to be really careful about where they're gonna to go to college to make sure that basically where they're going is gonna match their experience and you know perhaps subconscious expectations about what a good education should be. So that's, they really do have to be careful. And, you know, I, I, Gerard, what, where are you? What, what country are you in? I'm in South Africa. That's what I thought, you know, and, and we do have an added advantage. Um, I was remembering that from, I, I saw before. And so, you know, you've obviously have, it's a very different educational system in most of the world than it is in the U.S. And one of the advantages I would say of the U.S. system, not, not that it's better in all ways, but in one way, they have a tremendous number of colleges you can choose yeah. from. So, you know, it's not all about status. It's not, and, and, and we're somehow ingrained that's ingrained in us isn't it that your goal is to go to you know i grew up on the east coast and it's especially strong in the east coast that that you want to go to the college that has the most status somehow that the most prestigious school that you can get into and and honestly i think we have to i encourage my students to look more deeply and to realize that you know that you want to have the best education for you and there are some co colleges and universities out there that it is all about a game it is all about just test scores and it's not very personal and it may be a great education in many ways but maybe that's not the best place for you you really need to think about these sort of things so i just wanted to point some of that out and what, one thing i'd add too is while it is great to question things and be inquisitive it, there's a burden to that as well, because one thing I've learned is that there's things that I question and it makes people super uncomfortable. And so, um, so I have to balance that of like, uh, it's okay to have this question, but I, what's the right um, platform or avenue for me to be asking those questions? And so I guess there's, there's a balancing act that kids kids have to figure out how they navigate the world because there's there's times I've asked questions like the example of me asking the question of the woman at the state board of education where she's super angry that I even had the question so there's a burden to that as well and I think that's something that we have to figure out a way to help kids balance that too, because they should question things and they should be learning things, but also figure out the best way to do it so that doesn't cause some doors to slam. Um, and that's tricky, especially, especially um, lately. <laughs> um, so another thing that we've had confusion about is what the role of sports is in Waldorf education. And, and we've talked a bit about um, the competition that gets driven in and how competition's important. And so this was a, I was gonna ask um, Harard about this. 
specifically what what your take was on that this is um kind of a bit of a bread and butter question for me because as uh, we're also a country we, we we love our sport it's competitive um and these it, it, it becomes very controversial of people's perceptions thereof okay so i've been very lucky to have coached uh, uh, all kinds of codes of sport and so again with everything that we do we look again at age appropriate okay the competition okay I, i'm going to use your nfl okay everybody wants to be tom brady but there are 300 million is it a quarterback? Am I right? Is he a quarterback? Right. In our country, it's rugby. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm learning about NFL. Um, but so, like in our country, it's the rugby, and, and we push, and you go to a good school, and, and you get um, a bursary and all that. But you know what? Your knee pops, and your, your parents don't have that kind of money, and, and it escalates. Okay, so that's just your cautionary tale. So what we do is, and for me... Um, I, I love movement with, with children. And at the moment, I've got class twos. So I, I do roly-polies with them. They're in their bodies. They are strong, you know, and, and they, they move. And these days, you know, I think everything is in fitness is about strength, but children don't know how to move. Children should move, and they should move well. And they should know. And I, I get everybody wants a six-pack and a chest out to here, and they – you know, they can't do a pull-up and they can't do a roly-poly and they can't, and, but there's a way that that's also moving into really people getting in touch with their movement. And, and I've just seen the benefits of what that does just in the morning before you start your day. And I, I love it. Juggling, all of that incorporate. So there, there is a place for sport and it's good. Just like, again, your main lesson, there should be discipline as well. You know, there's, there are rules in a, in a main lesson. There are rules when you do math, science, whatever, and you have a will. The same with your sport. It, and I think there's a misconception. Yeah, everyone just runs. We, we play and we find fairies and we look. It's not what happens. It's, there's a structure and it's good for them. The children should have structure as well. But what we want to try and ingrain is don't shout at the ref. Don't scream. Don't be a bad sportsman. There's an inner discipline. I was very fortunate enough when I started at a world of school, they had rock climbing uh, on the premises. So we had natural cliffs. I came from a conventional school where I was coaching soccer, rugby, cricket, swimming, cross country and all this. And I came to school and I didn't know anything about rock climbing and I learned and I loved it because I saw how children do the inner work. It was the beautiful analogy of you in competition with yourself from a child scared of heights at the beginning, not knowing how to boulder to, and you see these boys and girls growing up and being strong in their bodies and doing a pull up on a door. And of course their teacher can't do that, you know, but it's, and, and so that is the focus. It's not that there's no sport, but we work on it being age appropriate. And, you know, I've had the horrible experiences of, 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 of riffing a game or being there and parents shouting and, you know, screaming at their, at their child because they've maybe missed a ball or missed a thing. And, and, and for a man that I love the sport, I, I, I don't like that. And it's not right. And we, we, there's a way of living vicariously through your children. But then there's also, and I think if your child has a skill, hone it. You know, like many sporting coaches, they man-manage. Not that you want to man-manage a child because I don't think that's appropriate. But see that your child is is good at something but if he's got a golden arm and he's six you can't go and throw a ball 600 times in the afternoon you're going to hurt him but you can see it and everybody wants their child to be a good golfer because maybe they didn't take care of their pension plan and maybe that's going to work out for them but this is the and and, and i love speaking to dads about that and saying there is a place for it it's and you know what if, if schools are small they are clubs I, I, and again i speak you have Little League and things like that, am I correct, and Pee Wee League and, and, and so on. And I think people have also moved on of seeing, you know, little boys or girls, they get hurt on a field and come on, shake off the tears, let's go. And it's not good. So you move away from that. And of course, children that stay um, 
in classes together all the way through. They, they play together. And I, I was also very blessed to have coached my son. Uh, I was teaching and my children on the same school and I could coach soccer with them. And, and you know what? Dads, we forget they must have fun. And you know what? The more fun they have, the better they are. And they score goals and they win and they enjoy themselves. So it is, it is that moment of, again, taking what, even in, in, in your lessons and having that structure and having that rhythm, bringing it onto a sports field because it, it makes them strong. It makes them good. It, and they, get, they see the whole picture. Um, and then they find their passion. You know, I, I, recently I heard of a, a boy his whole life. He, his parents had enough funds to assist him in his golfing career. He was fantastic. He was sponsored. He was everything. When he turned, and the rest of us, when we heard the story, we were so, why did you give it up? When he turned 18, he said to his dad, I have had enough. I can't do the hotel rooms anymore. Yes, he's sponsored by Under Armour and Titleist and everything, but he didn't have a childhood. He didn't have friends. He, yes, he had a tutor, but, and he's good. He need to, and now he hates it. He hates it. He doesn't want to do it anymore. So, and again, those are cautionary tales, but it's, and I, sorry, it's my little soapbox thing. I, and, and as much as we love sport and we love the movement and we, we want, again, the best for our children, um, we do it differently in just that there is also a consciousness in sport. That's really good. And as far as movement goes, we, we always talk about having pliable exhaustion where we get the, some of the energy burned out so that they're, and one example that I, we, we used to live in San Diego and now, and now we live in Arizona, but we lived a few blocks from the beach and there was Sandy beach, but there was also like cliffs and rocks. And there were days where I would take them out and we would traverse one end of these, these giant boulders to get to the other end. And it, cause it made them have to, to think as well as like, where's the right place to step and how to get to one end or the other. And they were, we, I would take them and there was some concern that it was a bit dangerous, but I'd take them and come back and they were so, so agreeable <laughs> after we would do that exercise. Um, but Soraya didn't like to see all the crabs running around because she, because she thought there was lots of crabs and she thought they were going to get her, but they didn't care about what she was doing. <laughs> but um, so here's another qu a question that's um, for for Hard and Mark is what would what's the best way for for dads to support their children's Waldorf teacher? Uh, Mark, you want to go first? All right. Um, in my experience, um, especially for, um, for dads who are less familiar with Waldorf education, and Eric, you brought up that um, most of the signups that you have, most of the registrations that you have are driven by the moms. Um, and 95%, I would say. Yeah. Or and um, and so the the dads um, sometimes are on board, but not sure what to do about it. Sometimes they um, I've I've had experiences where the the dad is opposed and is looking for more of the uh, kind of education that Jamie was talking about earlier, where it's just like facts, 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 test, 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 um, and um, so as a Waldorf dad, um, I think there are two things that I, well, three things that I thought about. One is to um, educate yourself about Waldorf education and about the reasons we approach it in the way we do for the sake of the children. We approach them in ways that are developmentally appropriate in all of their stages, we approach it with a very deep thought and holding, energetic holding of the child um, and their journey. And we approach it uh, according to each child that is in our care, not like this is a group of students and I'm gonna treat them all the same. Um, and so uh, for the dads, I would encourage you to, to 
read some books about Waldorf education, um, uh, just to understand a little bit better what the process is that we're working with. Um, and to, it, it, it can kind of be a leap of faith. And I'm, I'm speaking especially to the dads who are skeptical about it, who are, or who are on board, but not sure what's really going on. Um, it's a little bit of a leap of faith, uh, but trust your teacher because the the teachers really i mean our, our main thing is having the the best interest of each of the students at heart and and i mean that truly not just as as a, um you know a figure of speech it is from the heart that, that we approach these children um head heart and hands yes but there's there's a holding of the of the group and of each individual child that that it's it's deep um so it's taking that leap of faith and trusting that your teacher is is there um and that uh that we do approach each child individually um it's not just a you know a catch-all for everybody um and then as far as uh supporting your teacher um, at home there's often an impulse, especially with dads, especially with, and I'm speaking to, you know, my own experience as well, um, of, you know, we're, we're, we want to fix things. We want to fix it. If we, if we perceive there's a problem, we want to just like make it right. Um, and uh, we, we as parents, I think, need to allow space for the students to make their own mistakes and to fail and sometimes fail big because that's powerful learning that happens. To be there to support them, right? And, you know, and not, not, to, um, <laughs> not to say, oh, well, you failed at that, <laughs> but, but to, to, to say, oh, I, you know, I recognize that, that learning that just happened for you, um, to accept and observe and support and not try to try to overmanage or to fix things. Offer instead of offering a solution to you know, so the child is is doing their doing their work from main lesson, right? And they've they've got some homework to do where they're um, uh, it's a it's a math problem or it's um a geographical drawing you know a map of something and and when they're when they're having trouble figuring something out to be there to offer a question that inspires rather than to say oh it's like this and fixing it um you know and i, I <laughs> I'm, I'm speaking from my own experience because I fix things. I do like, you know, something's broken in the house. I don't call a guy. I get my tools and I fix it. Right. And so, um, yeah, so I had to learn with my kids, um, that there is tremendous value in being there, uh, supporting, observing, and perhaps nudging in, a direction that will help them discover it on their own because it's so much more powerful to the learning of the child when they discover the solution, when they are allowed, when they're given space to make that discovery, that, that stays with them. Um, and swooping in and fixing it and saving the day, it, it, it saves the day, but it, it doesn't last. My experience and it's huge for their confidence when they figured it out yeah for themselves. yeah um, I, just, I just want to ask uh, uh, just add, add a little thing I, I think sometimes um with 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 the dads when we talk about the gnomes and the theories and and the things i think there's this not reticence because i mean if, if you think about the grimm's fairy tales they actually so beautiful and you know even you read through those some of them are quite horrific but um i 
I, I got very excited when we started this. And uh, sorry, Matt, I think, uh, did you start the Waldorf Dads um, website or, or group? <clears throat> yeah. Because that, that in itself, I, you, you know, I think when you look at statistics, and Eric, when you start a conversation with, you know, 95% are, are moms, and, 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 I, and I get that's the way it's going, um, I, I just think it's, it's very often the dads sometimes get involved when things go wrong, you know, or they, okay, they're not happy about, or, or there's a struggle. So you, the, it's not the best delivery or then again, like you say, let's fix it. So I think often there's the fear factor or the, we don't understand it. So my one thing is to always ask, don't make fun of it. It's, it's, it's a little thing because you, you sometimes the children are small and you're making fun of, let's say, the fairies or you, you're undermining it. Uh, uh, and I don't want to come over preachy, but have that conversation, have the buy-in with, with your teacher. And, and for me, I, I love having moments like this. And sometimes the dad's also just too shy to maybe ask something in a parent's evening. And like for one of my things, I've, I've wanted to maybe have a Zoom meeting where only the dads come. And I, I don't mean to be exclusive, but then, you know, then they can ask, can we have a conversation about, because we don't maybe understand you with me so well, or why is the reading happening so late? And um, Paul explained that so nicely, but you can bring that again across and, and allay those fears, because you always have that conversation um, late in the year, I get it, but I'm worried. And they come very diplomatically. So I think your the, the support, as much as you can support the teacher, you, you have to kind of, it becomes community very quickly. And we bandy that about easily. But, you know, and dudes, we don't ask questions. We just, hey, you know what, I'll go fetch my toolbox and everything will be okay. And you know what, I'll just suck it up. And then it doesn't work. And then at the end, you start being passive aggressive, making fun of it, and you're doing damage. And, and when you could have just asked a question or joined, joined Matt's little group and say, hey, man, Matt, what's going on here? Because I think those things are very, very powerful and, and it works well. Yeah. And, and that's kind of why I started it is I, you know, I'm not pretending to be an expert. I'm saying I'm being proactive about, you know, my daughter's education and then now my son in, in later this month about being involved with it and so I'm like you know for the other dads out there you know and some of my other friends who just had kids too it's like let's look at this and 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 learn with them I'm excited about it so yeah I'm not trying to be an expert I'm I'm trying to learn it because I just feel like I would have benefited from this when I was their age and and on so um, I think it's amazing Matt, that you're starting this when your daughter is under a year old that's like yeah that's pretty incredible. That's you talk about proactive. That's that's really proactive. Yeah, I'm trying to. If you see, I'm kind of muting here, muting there, because she's she's kind of she's my wife trying to fall asleep now, so she's being a little vocal, which is super cozy. But um, trying to keep it so everyone can hear. Um, yeah, no, I, I the early education too is that's that's I guess where I'm involved. You guys, it sounds like have the kids are a little bit older and getting into the reading and stuff, and I'm really excited about that so i feel like i'm gonna learn a lot like you said from you guys hearing that the kids are learning to talk later maybe than other kids but it's like they're they're the understanding and the platform the the foundation being much stronger and more solidified that it's i'm really excited about this so yeah i'm looking forward to it Wait. It looks like we are running out of time, uh, so we're going to wrap things up, but I'm really thinking about doing this again, um, so we're going to figure out when. Um, I had a couple of things um, to say, too, as far as, like, we're talking about the dads and the moms kind of, in, the, the moms initiating it and the dads trying to figure it out. What's really funny is over the last 15 years, we have been roped into um, so much marriage counseling. Like, it's like, come to us for curriculum. And then, and there are times where the dad's opposed to it, but there's times where there's already a problem in the marriage and the mom and the kids like, 
we just don't want to deal with dad. So we're just going to go off over here and do this. And the dad's left behind one. Where did they go? What's just happened here? Now they're doing these things. I don't get it. And I guess I'll just sit and watch TV because I'm, I'm out of the loop. So it's like we've seen both ways. But yeah, we've, we've, we've had so much um, like so, um, having to helping people solve problems that were not really like within our original scope of what we were doing has been extremely interesting. Um, Mark mentioned about reading books on Waldorf and, and I know Jack, you have a, a book um, on Waldorf. What, would, what can you tell us about, about the book you'd, you've written that you would recommend that, that people check out? Well, I, you know, I never recommend my own books, but <laughs> it, it's, it's called Understanding Waldorf, Teaching from the Inside Out. And um, we had a grant to write that book um, to explain Waldorf education in an accessible way. And that was the hope when we uh, put the book together. Um, yeah, I also had a book on dads uh, that I wrote years ago called Covering Home. And it's lessons on the art of fathering from the game of baseball, which is a little eccentric, but um, you know, two things that I love, I love baseball and I love being a dad. So they went together. Um, but I also wanted to say, Eric, just cause you're wrapping up. I just wanted to say thank you for putting this together. And I just wanted to thank the gentlemen who were here cause it was really a pleasure to listen to everything everyone had to say.